Okay, uh, before moving on, there is uh, one more point that I'd like to make. Uh, the point is, um, so every dollar, if, if it's uh, every dollar of a government spending increases, increase, I'm sorry, every dollar of a government spending increase, it adds to the aggregate spending. So if delta G, if government expenditure increases by delta G, then people's income initially increases by delta G. However, if there is a tax cut uh, by the amount delta T, then um, the initial increase in consumption it's not gonna be delta T, rather MPC times delta T. And therefore, uh, basically for tax cuts, the fraction 1 minus MPC of the tax cut, this is what it uh, leaks into saving. And as a result, aggregate spending only rises by MPC times the tax cut. The main point is that the effects on interest rate and output y are much smaller for delta t than for an equal change in government expenditure delta g that means this change in output from y1 to y2 under a tax cut of delta t uh, which yes if we assume to be equal to delta g then this change in output it's going to be much smaller than if than it was under a change in government expenditure by the same amount so if even if we assume that the change in government expenditure delta g is equal to delta t under a tax cut, the change in the equilibrium output is smaller than it is under a change in government expenditure by them on delta G. Um, there is uh, one more thing that you may you may wonder, which is that uh, the ice curve is shifting to the right. But how come the ice curve? I, uh, we show it here as an we show it that it's a negative shift here because we have a minus sign here. Uh, the reason is the reason is in this particular case when we have a tax cut. This delta t is a, is, a, is a negative number. When tax de decreases, this delta t becomes a negative number. So this negative number times this negative MPC, uh, they, these, these two negative numbers, they cancel each other out. These two negative signs, they cancel each other out. As a result, this, this whole term here, it becomes a positive number. And since it's a positive number, I's curve shifts to the right. Um, so that's about it. Let's go and take a look at take a look at uh, monetary policy now. Suppose that the Fed increases the money supply. So we have seen before that if there is an increase in money supply, then the LM curve, this is going to shift to the right as well. So if it shifts to the right, it will lead to a fall in equilibrium interest rate to R2 and an increase in equilibrium output to Y2. Um, so what's the economic intuition behind this? Well, if there is an increase in money supply, we know that now the banks are holding more money than they would like. Therefore, they would cut down their interest rate so that they can attract more borrowers. So that's the reason why the interest rate in the equilibrium decreases from R1 to R2. Now, why does the output increase? Remember, this is what the change in interest rate is, is, is what's happening in the money market. But as I said before, it has a ramification uh, for the goods market as well because in the goods market investment is dependent on interest rates so if interest rate declines investment increases since investment is a function of interest rate if investment rises it's also gonna increase the equilibrium output and that's exactly what we see here that output increases from y1 to y2 uh, when there is an increase in money supply Okay, so so far we assumed that monetary and fiscal policies, they were independent of each other. But in the real world, it's quite possible that monetary policy makers may respond to changes in fiscal policy. For example, if the government increases its expenditure by delta G, then the monetary policy makers may adjust the money supply accordingly. Um, and the, f the fiscal policy makers could also do, do the same if they... Uh, if they if they find monetary policy makers, uh, they are either increasing the money supply or decreasing the money supply. So these kind of interactions between the monetary policy makers and the fiscal policy makers uh, have the potential to alter the impact of the uh, original policy change. So let's let's take a take a look at an example where the Fed uh, resp responds to an increase in government expenditure. So the government increases its, its uh, expenditure. Now the Fed, 
can have uh, the Fed has three possible responses to, to this particular change in government expenditure. Either the Fed does nothing, which basically means holding money supply constant, or the Fed can decide to increase interest, uh, I'm sorry, hold interest rate constant, or the third option is they can decide to hold Y constant. So in each of these cases, the effects of the initial change in government expenditure is going to be different. So let's take a look at that now. So here we have an increase in government expenditure, quite uh, as you expect. As you expected, the IS curve as a result shift, shifts upward from IS1 to IS2, resulting in a higher equilibrium interest rate and higher equilibrium output. Now, when the Fed, when the central bank is faced with this, with this scenario, the Fed has three options, as I told you before. First option is just do nothing, allow this to happen, allow the inter equilibrium interest rate to rise, equilibrium output to rise, uh, which basically means the Fed has decided to hold money supply constant. Remember, that's the only that's the tool that the Fed uses to to influence the economy. The money supply uh, is their tool, so they're they're not using their tool in this particular case. They're just sitting idle. Um, just letting the letting the government letting the fiscal policy have an impact on the economy. So that's so that's when the Fed doesn't do anything. Let's take a look at the second case where the Fed does respond. So first of all, uh, as I say, the Fed doesn't want to do here anything, but it's quite by the Fed, if the Fed wants, they can hold they can try to hold the interest rate fixed at R one here. Okay, they can hold the interest rate R1 here. The question is, how can they do that? Well, if they want to hold the interest rate R1, what they can do is uh, they can increase the money supply. So if they increase the money supply, then the interest equilibrium interest rate in the money market is going to fall down from R1 to R2. If they can increase money supply by uh, an appropriate amount. So if the Fed can increase the money supply by an appropriate amount, then the equilibrium interest rate in the economy is going to come back from R1 to R2, the original interest rate, uh, before the government expenditure increased. But look what happens to the equilibrium output now. You can see that because of an increase in money supply, the equilibrium output has further increased from Y2 to Y3. Remember, Y2 was the output equilibrium output after the government increase its expenditure but y3 is the equilibrium output now when the fed has responded to 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 uh, to the government policy of in, of increased government expenditure so the bottom line here is that the is here that if the fed wants to hold the interest rate constant it will have to increase the uh, increase the money supply, which will lower the interest rate and bring it back to the uh, original interest rate, but it's also going to result in an even higher equilibrium output Y3. Okay, so there is, so if compared to the original situation, there is no change in interest rate, but the output changes from Y1 to Y3. So that's given by delta Y is equal to the difference between Y3 and Y1. Let's look at the third case. The third case is where the Fed wants to hold the output in the economy constant. Okay, so basically the IS curve shifts upward when the government expenditure increases, resulting in higher interest rate R2 and equilibrium output Y2. But the Fed, for some reason, doesn't want the equilibrium output Y2. Rather, they want to bring it back to the original equilibrium output Y1. So what they can do in this particular case is they can decrease the money supply by an appropriate amount such that the LM curve shifts from LM1 to LM2 in a manner that the interest rate rises from, R, from R1 to R3, but at the same time, the equilibrium output comes back from Y2 to Y1. And the final result here is that the the change in event the, uh, the eventual change in uh, equilibrium output is zero because it has come back from y2 to y1 the original uh, original level of output but the economy now has to has to experience a, an increase in interest rate from r1 to r3 since the uh, the fed decreased the money supply so these are the three possible responses from the uh, that we we can think of 
uh, that the Fed can use uh, when the gov when the Congress uh, raises government expenditure. So we have taken we we have looked at examples when uh, when there's a change in fiscal policy or when there's a change in monetary policy how we can analyze these these policy changes using ISLM models is using the ISLM model. Now let's see how we can analyze shocks to the IS curve and shocks to the LM curve using this model. So what do you mean by IS shocks? IS shocks means any, any exogenous changes in the demand for goods and services. I have two examples here. The first example uh, is of a stock market boom or maybe a stock market crash. So it's an, exalt, it's an example of exogenous change in demand for goods and services because you can imagine if there is a stock market boom, it's going to increase the household wealth and therefore uh, the consumption is going to increase. There is another example of an exogenous change in demand for goods and services which is coming from an exogenous change in business or consumer confidence or expectations. If for some reason consumers or businesses start thinking that the economy is going to slow down uh, probably in the next two quarters, then the businesses will become uh, more circumspect and probably cut down the current investments. So the consumers, if the consumers feel that uh, the economy is going to slow down, their income is going gonna, is, is gonna to decrease in the coming months, then they'll probably cut down their consumption. So these are all example, different examples of IS shocks. Similarly, we can also have LM shocks, which are exogenous changes in the demand for money. Uh, one of the examples is something we discussed in the class before. Uh, it's a wave of credit card fraud, which increases demand for money. So it's an exogenous change in the demand for money. Um, the second example is that if we have more ATMs, then we'll probably... Well, our demand for money is going to go down because we don't really have to hold money all the time because we always have access to more uh, ATMs and we can just withdraw money whenever we like. So we don't have to hold money all the time. So our money demand is going to fall when we have more ATMs. So that's also an exogenous change in the demand for money. So let's analyze them using the ISLM model. We have an exercise. So suppose there is a housing market crash. That's exactly what happened in 2007. Suppose there's a housing market crash that reduces consumers' wealth. So how how do we go about uh, analyzing the effects uh, of this? So for each shock, we have to use the ISLM model to determine the effects on output Y and interest rate R. And we also have to figure out what happens to consumption, investment, and uh, the unemployment rate. So let's do the first question first, then we'll come back and do the second. Oops and do the second question. So here you go, the first question. We have a housing market crash which uh, reduces consumers' consumption, okay, uh, because they have a decline in their wealth. So ice curve should, should shift to the left because we know when there is a decline in, uh, decline in output, out, uh, the ice curve shifts, shifts, down, shifts downward. Uh, so a downward shift in the IS curve will result in lower interest equilibrium interest rate R2 and lower equilibrium output Y2. So remember, we have a housing market crash which declines uh, people's wealth. And since their wealth declines, their consumption is going to fall. Okay. Since the consumption falls, their money demand you can expect to also be lower. As their money demand is lower, the banks will... Ch will, will, will uh, will cut down their interest rate to attract more borrowers because people are just not borrowing much from them since money demand is low. And when uh, uh, interest rate decreases, uh, investment rises at the same time. But the out output decreases from Y1 to Y2 anyway. But this decrease in output from Y1 to Y2, if you look at this difference between Y1 and Y2, it's much smaller than the uh, original shift in the IS curve that is because uh, that is because we do have an increase in investment because of lower interest rate which makes this diff which makes which reduces this difference between IS2 and IS1 as a result the change in equilibrium output between Y1 and Y2 is, is smaller than we would see under um, under a Keynesian cross model so if output decreases, 
It's uh, according to Oakland's law, you'd expect unemployment rate to rise because if there is less production in the economy, less people will be hired. So unemployment rate is gonna is gonna shoot up when we have a housing market crash. Okay, so let's go back and take a look at the second exercise question. It was about uh, consumers using cash in transactions more frequently in response to an increase in identity theft. So it's very similar to the example that we discussed in the class before, which was uh, that there was uh, a credit card theft. So basically, in this particular case, cons consumers' money demand is going to increase because they're using more cash in transactions now. So we, we have seen before that if money money demand increases, then the LM curve, according to uh, LM curve, shifts upward. And if the LM curve shifts upward, uh, then the equilibrium interest rate in the economy should rise and the equilibrium output should fall. The, the question is, what's, what's, what's the economic intuition behind this? Well, first of all, if there is an increase in money demand, then the banks will start charging higher interest rate, right? because there are more borrowers now coming to the bank uh, demanding more money or they don't actually have to be borrowers just people don't want to keep their money in the bank they they just want to use more cash so they're trying to withdraw more money from the bank and the banks are just uh, entice them by increasing the interest rate the banks will tell them hey uh, we're gonna increase our interest rates uh, keep your money in the bank, don't withdraw it. So that's why we see an increase in interest rate from R1 to R2. Um, uh, then what, what we also have here is a decrease in output from Y1 to Y2. And that's because when interest rate rises from R1 to R2, uh, then investment is going to fall. Since investment falls, output, which is basically a function of investment, or Y, which is a function of investment, is also going to drop from Y1 to Y2. Again, we have a fall in output, and according to Okun's law, unemployment rate should rise, because unemployment rate and output, they're uh, related to each other. If unemployment rises, if output rises, unemployment rate should fall. If unemployment, if, if output decreases, unemployment should rise. So uh, that's the answer to the second exercise. Um, so I hope you you understand you you have a good you have had a good review of this first part from chapter twelve. Uh, the second part of, cha of the chapter chapter twelve is what I intend to cover in the lecture tomorrow. So if you have any questions, please do let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for your attention.